I'll come up. I'll come up. over the refugee and upholds the orphan and widow. 
Come sing praise to God. We, we will praise, praise God as long as we live. live. Our God loves those who do right, who are righteous in his sight, but deliberately <coughs> thwarts those who do evil. Come sing praise to God. We will praise God as long as we live. Let's prepare our hearts.
but we who <coughs> fail to make these our first priority are invited to confess our neglect and to seek the empowerment to live more faithfully. So let us pray together the general prayer confession found in your book. God of all compassion, we admit to you that we have a great deal of difficulty following the meanings of simplifying law. For we take love as a matter of whim rather than as an act of will. Forgive us to pray. Teach us by your grace and spirit to love more perfectly both you and one another. To the end that your kingdom may indeed come on the earth. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Be at peace. In Jesus, we are forgiven. We are made new. We are redeemed. Thanks be to God. And let us now in response pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You know what Jesus said to him? He said, 
love the Lord your God. So first of all is to love God and first of, and to know that God is one. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. And he said, with all of your, your mind, of all of your heart, of all your strength. And so Jesus could have answered any of the Ten Commandments, or he could have answered all the hundreds of laws that were there. But he knew what was more important is to love God, to love others, and to love yourself. So when Jesus answered, the people wouldn't ask any more questions because they thought, oh, we don't know how to really do this. And they were kind of afraid because it was so different from what they were used to. So the most important thing for us to remember is that God says, I want you to love me so I can love you and to love others. So you think you can remember that? Mm -hmm. To love others and be kind to others? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father, we do ask that you help us today, that we would love you with all our hearts, with all our souls, and all our strength and our minds, and that we would love others as we love ourselves. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I've got some conversations for you.
that's found on page 1575 and 1576 in your pew Bible. Let us listen to the word of God. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, said Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. <clears throat> the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him, any more questions? This is God's word to us today. But what shall we offer in thanksgiving for Christ's sacrifice? And how will we return the love poured out on our behalf? Surely love of God and neighbor prompts our generous response. Let us answer God's abundant provision for us through joy and sharing as we represent our tithe, our offerings, and our very lives. <coughs> And so today, as we continue our worship 
of you, O oh Lord. We ask that by the power of your Spirit, that you will move mightily among us. That as we continue to worship you and meditate upon your word, you will renew our minds, that we will see the truth of who you really are. That you will open our ears, that we will hear your voice of love. And indeed, that you will remove the barriers that be in our heart. <coughs> that you would tenderize us. That indeed, our hearts would be good soil for the planting of your word. <coughs> to the glory of your name. That we would indeed bear good fruit. And Lord, I pray that the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips will be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul, in his great chapter on love, 1 Corinthians 13, ends the chapter with these words. He says, Now we see as a poor reflection in a mirror. And another translation puts it this way we don't see things clearly. It's like we're squinting in a fog and peering through a mist. But there'll come a time when we will see face to face. And it, it's like it won't be long until the weather clears and the sun shines bright. Because now we know in part. But then... I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. It says, we'll see it all. We'll see as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. And the greatest of these three remain, faith, hope, and love. It says that the grace of these is love. But right now, until that completion, we have three things to lead us towards consummation. That we would trust steadily in God. We would hope unswervingly. We would love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. Well, these verses really sum up both of our readings for today, I, for service in itself. These three things remain, but the greatest, the most important, is love. So when we read Psalm 146, the psalmist exhorts us to do what he's doing. Praise the Lord, my soul. Now, I always hear that and I think about my time when I went to Kenya and the most common language there is Swahili and so they would tell us to praise the Lord and they would say it in the King's English but then they would say it in Swahili and it's Buana Esafiri and so we practiced that Buana Esafiri. And it wasn't until later that I was watching a Tarzan movie that I heard the word Wana. Because Wana means master. So it gave me a whole different concept and an understanding about Wana as if you praise the Lord, praise that He is our master. He is the one that is over us and directs us. <coughs> then he goes on. The psalmist and says, Praise the Lord, my soul. Well, we don't always have a real good understanding of what soul means. So, one of my favorite resources was in a book by Watchman Nee called The Release of the Spirit, and it was this diagram. And it helped me to understand. He said that here is our is our spirit. And so when we accept Jesus into our lives and proclaim him as our Lord, our Savior, the Holy Spirit then begins to dwell with our spirit. 
Now, this next layer is our soul, what he calls in the book the outer man or the outer woman. And our soul is made up of our mind, our intellect, our will, and our emotions. And then, of course, then we have our body, which is the outermost man or woman. And again, the call for us to praise God is with all of our being. But in particular, when he says, praise the Lord all my soul. So that means praise God with our minds, with our emotions, with our heart, <coughs> with everything that's within us. And of course, we know in in, uh, in Hebrews where it even talks about to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So God really wants us to worship him with everything we are. So the psalmist is telling us God really wants us to worship him with everything we are, and not just on Sundays, which is our traditional time of worship, but always. The psalmist says, all day long, for as long as we live. But then the psalmist challenges us with this question. Where do you put your trust, your faith, and then, where do you put your hope? You see, faith is an action word. It's not just the statement of what we believe. And I, I love the definition. It's, it's like that you've had a knee that has been replaced, and you can suddenly put your full weight, just like Mary Alice can with her, her new bionic knee. She can put her full weight on it. So this is what God is saying. I want you to be able to put your full weight on me. And then for an understanding of hope, I, I really like the President uh, Theodore Roosevelt's definition of hope. He said, hope is the knot at the end of a rope. So who or what? Do we put our full force of weight on? What enables us to be at the end of our rope and put a knot in it and hold on? Well, Psalm 146 says, you know, the whole world is full of experts. It's full of people and authority. Now, they, there may be kings, and queens, there may be princes and princesses. And as human beings, we tend to trust many times in them and put hope in them. <coughs> but as Eugene Peterson says, these are ones who really know very little of what he calls salvation life. That no matter how convincing these in royalty or an authority may be, they are mortal. One day they will die. And many of them, their projects will die with them. So the psalmist says, put your hope, put your trust in the God of Jacob. Let him be the one that helps you tie that knot at the end of your rope. And if you will put your trust in him, put your hope in him, you will be blessed. So what are the true blessings and happinesses that are promised in Psalm 146? It says, you'll be blessed because this is the God who is your creator. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the maker of all the seas. And he knows every single thing in the sea. In other words, our God is the master designer. 
He is the one that has created us <coughs> with a plan and with a purpose. And then the psalmist goes on and says, but not only that, he's a God who is faithful. That he always does what he says. That he is known for being consistent always. And not only that, this God of Jacob is compassionate. He's full of mercy and he executes justice with integrity. So listen to the list that the psalmist makes for us. That he defends the wrong, he feeds the hungry, he frees the prisoners, he gives sight to the blind, he lifts up the fallen or those bowed down, he showers those with love who are in right standing with him, which is what righteousness means. He protects strangers and foreigners. He takes the side of the orphans and widows. But this God is also a God of justice. That he sets out for us a new set of rules for living and loving. But he will frustrate the plans of those who refuse this new way of life, the wicked. So in our first reading, Psalm 146, we see and experience the character of God, the basic nature of who God is, and his divine disposition. So that we can put our faith, our trust in him. We can hope in him, the one who reigns forever. The God who's always in charge. The one who says, faith and hope and love will remain. So our, our Mark text opens with a good debate. Now, a, a teacher of the law, we're not really told for sure whether he is just a scribe or a religious scholar, whether he's a Sadducee or a Pharisee. We just know that he is a religious scholar and that he has been observing the lively debates surrounding Jesus. Now he notices how sharp Jesus is. <laughs> and so he puts this question to Jesus. Which is the most important of all the commandments? Now, part of the culture of the Jewish rabbis is they love a good debate. And it appears this time, this scholar is really wanting an answer. He's inquiring. It's not a trap like we have seen in the past by some of the rabbis. But he, it's a true inquiry. Now, one commentator said, when you look at what the Jewish people, especially the scholars of that time, would do, they had a double tendency. First of all, was to take the law and then multiply to to go ahead and break down the law into hundreds if not thousands of rules and regulations and so they tended to either do this which we know that there were hundreds almost thousands of laws on the books by the time of jesus or there was a tendency to try to gather up the law into just one sentence or one statement that would be a, um, a summary of the whole message. And so when Jesus hears the question, he reaches back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6. Four to six. It's known as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Now it's interesting, Jesus expands it a little bit to include our minds. It's, uh, uh, again, just a reminder that Jesus tells us for us to allow God to renew our minds, to really fine-tune even how we think. But then Jesus continues, and he couples it with a, um, a text from Leviticus, Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But Jesus is not only combining these two together, but he's expanding the text. You see, in the original there in Leviticus, it was just for the people of Israel. But Jesus is really saying, love your neighbor, even if they are Gentiles, not just the sons of your people. Now, it's amazing what happens is that the conversation shifts as this religious scholar seems to understand that Jesus is really shifting the focus of worshiping God from a type of worship of sacrifice, of burnt offering, which was taking place in the temple, the sacrifice of the um, you know, whatever was there presented, the, the lamb uh, and the burnt offering that was taking place in the temple over and over again. But this scholar seemed to understand, Jesus, you're saying that to love God, to love others, and love yourself, is the worship of God is an all-encompassing worship of love and that it's better than the sacrifice that takes place in the temple. In fact, the, the message says, oh, wonderful teacher, this is what the scholar says, you are so lucid and accurate that God is one and there's no other and that loving him with passion and intelligence and energy and loving others as well as you love yourself. That's better than all the obediences and sacrifices put together. Now Jesus, I believe, was delighted. I believe that he must have smiled and looked at him and said, you are so close to the kingdom of God. You're right on the border of the kingdom of God. And you're saying, do you want to join in and understand what this kingdom is all about that I am ushering in? But at that point, the challenge for change was too much for the scholar. In fact, all of the disciples and those around dared not ask any more questions. So, what is the most important command for us today? What's the bottom line for us as being a follower of Jesus Christ, a member of the kingdom of God? Well, we like short answers too. Sometimes we're, our models are love God, love others. Others like the acronym of joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. But how do we love God? Well, I believe it begins first with letting God 
loved us. You know, 1 John 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us. You know, some of us may be afraid to let God love us because of the image that we have of God. So I believe the first step is saying, God, would you heal the image that I have of who you are? You know, some of us have an image that God is a God of wrath and anger and judgment. And we might need to pray that prayer of, dear God, my image of who you are is not one of a God of love, but a God of punishment and judgment. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and, and renew my mind change my heart that I have a true sense of who you are and that I'd be able to really love you with everything that I am. Please direct me to your word that would convey a true image that I'd be able to love you with all my heart. Well, I think that the next step of how to love God is to admit that we all have needs and that we need to be loved. You know, sometimes past hurts or trusting in mere mortals, we tend to adopt the phrase, I don't need others. I don't need love. But these are the words of a wounded heart. A heart that God is wanting to heal and make whole. And as we allow God to shower us with his love, we find that we are fulfilled. That we're able then to return that love to God and to even love others out of our own fulfillment. <laughs> of God's love. And you know, when we trust in God's love, then it pushes away our fears and it teaches us to embrace the love that does heal our wounds. Because we hear in 1 John that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, the most important command is to love. Love God, love others. And also in there is that to love ourselves as well. Now, it sounds pretty simple, but as one commentator says, you know that as we're following the law, sometimes we can lose touch of what's in our hearts. Or sometimes, even when we go through rituals, that we can lose the reason behind the ritual. And even in relationships, that we can lose love. But God calls us, just like he called the church of Ephesus there in Revelations 2, when he said, why have you walked away from your first love? What's going on with you? Let God be your first love. Now there was a time that I was praying with an intercessor and we were in a church and we were walking back and forth and just praying whatever God was putting on our hearts. And I, I looked at her and I said, you know, I think God is just calling us back to our first love. And I was really thinking of this scripture. And I'll never forget she stopped and she said, you think God's calling me to go back to my ex-husband? <laughs> And I said, no, 
No, God's saying, go back. Come back to me. Let me be your first love. Now, being part of the kingdom of God doesn't mean that we always agree or always have the right answers, even though we all search for the truth. Being part of the kingdom of God means living and doing and relating in ways that the love of God and the love of neighbor and the selfless love of self informs everything we do and disciplines us. The most important Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you today, we pray for those who feel betrayed. Those who don't know loyalty. Those who fear to trust or to love. Those who don't realize that they're already loved by you. The Lord our God is one. And we will love you with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength. And Lord, our prayer today is also for those that are without homes. Those that are fleeing from situations. Those that are evicted. Those that find themselves in worn places in strange lands. And so the Lord our God is one. And we will love with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our strength. And Lord, our prayer today is for the church. For all its branches of the vine, including this one that we're gathered in. Today, body of Christ, people of God, for whom the Lord our God is one, we will love with all our heart and with all our soul and all our strength. Lord, our, our prayer today is for those who are close to our hearts, those whom we have worried about and fretted about, those whom we miss, those who are carrying burdens at this time. Those, O oh Lord, that we have listed in our bulletin. We present to you, O oh Lord. The Lord our God is one, and we will love with all our heart and all our soul. Today we have a celebration of the Lord's table. It is a time where all people who have accepted Jesus are welcome to this table. So let us pray.
that as you have created each of us and have a plan and a purpose for our lives, that through the centuries, through all of time, you have sent your word to reveal who you are. You sent your prophets. And even at the times when we have turned away from you, you continue to reveal who you are to us. Until that time that you sent your very best, your one and only begotten Son, Jesus. And we thank you, Jesus, that you came, that you were willing to take on human flesh, and you would walk among us, that you would be tempted in all ways like we are, except without sin. Thank you for coming and showing us how to live, showing us the face of the Father, and being willing to go to the cross for the forgiveness of sin, for the redeeming of our lives that we could be transformed. Thank you, Jesus, for that sacrifice. Thank you for being the first fruit of the resurrection and showing us that you also give us life eternal. We are so grateful that we have a future with you forever in heaven. And we thank you that Jesus, that even now as you sit beside the Father, the right hand of the Father, that you did not leave us as orphans but you sent your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to guide us, to show us, to empower us. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming. We thank you now that you would come upon these mere elements, this bread, this wine, that as we partake, that indeed we will experience you afresh and anew. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And so, on that night so long ago, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks to the Father, and he broke the bread and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And in like manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. And so now every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim his life, his death, his resurrection until it comes again. So we have the gifts of God for the people of God. The elders will serve you, and I ask that you hold the elements and we'll partake together. <laughs>
the blood of Christ shed for us. Let's pray. Precious God, your presence is so real today. Just the overwhelming love that we sense this day. We thank you for feeding us at this table. We thank you for the preview of what it will be like on that great banquet day with you forever in heaven. But today, may we be so full of your love that as we leave this place, that love will overflow to all we see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn. Is they'll know we are Christians by our love and the two eighty-four. <laughs>